These disturbing photos turned a mysterious death case in Panama into a viral sensation. Two young women vanished on what was supposed to be a fun hike through the jungle, and for 10 weeks, nobody knew what the hell had happened. But then, the discovery of their discarded backpack broke the case wide open because inside of the backpack was a camera. The discovery of the girl's partial remains soon followed. Their camera contained over 100 photos and investigators hoped that it would shed some light on their timeline and into what could have possibly happened. But instead of providing answers, these photos simply did the opposite. The images spread rapidly throughout social media platforms and in just a short amount of time, it seemed as though everybody with an internet connection had a theory on what had happened. Many claimed that the girls had just gotten lost and died as a result, while others claimed the photographic evidence was clearly pointing towards foul play. Some people were even convinced that the girls were captured and eaten by cannibals. In this video, I'm going to be doing my very best to tell you the objective story of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon. I'm gonna be giving you the facts as I understand them without the spin and without bias. And at the end of the video, I'm gonna reveal to you the truth about this story. And honestly, I have to warn you, it's probably not gonna be what you want to hear. So let's start off with the elephant in the room, or at least the elephant in my room as the one who is making this video. The story of Chris Kremers and Lee Sanfrun is one of the most well-known and well-covered mysteries on the internet, full stop. There have been countless podcasts, YouTube videos, and documentaries done on this case. Tons of journalists have published articles about it, and there have even been books written about this case, multiple books. And so because of how well known this story is, I've honestly resisted making a video about it for a very long time. I also feel like there's a lot of people out there that know more about this story than I do, although I've certainly done my best to research it for this video. However, since the early days of telling stories on my channel, I've been getting tons of comments asking for me to cover it. This is by far the most requested story that I see you guys asking for. And I'm not gonna lie, I usually try to stick with like slightly lesser known stories, but due to popular demand, well, here we are. And to be honest with you, it's actually a little bit deeper than that as well. There's a reason that this story is so popular, so well known. I mean, two young girls had their promising lives abruptly ended for no discernible reason. And so because of that alone, I think it's worth doing my, albeit small part, in keeping this story relevant. And like I said in the intro, I'm gonna tell it with as little bias as I possibly can. And so with that said, let's take a trip together right now to the jungle of Panama. This trip is totally free, but you must hit that subscribe button to cover your admission especially if you're a repeat viewer. In the spring of 2014, two young girls took a once in a lifetime trip to Panama. Their names were Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, and they were both students from the Netherlands. They had apparently been planning this trip to Panama for a long time. I'm talking like six plus months. And by the way, they intended to do more than just see the scenery and take in the local culture while they were there. Of course, those were things that they absolutely wanted to do, but they also wanted to spend some time volunteering with and teaching children as well as learning Spanish. Their trip started off on the north coast of Panama, and then after a few weeks, they made their way inland to a small mountain town called Boquette. It's here in Boquette that our mystery begins, and of course that means the disturbing stuff also begins. And so before we get to that disturbing stuff, I wanna take a brief second to pause and to relax and to tell you about ritual. Oh, hey, I didn't, uh, I didn't see you there. 
Ritual is the sponsor of today's video. Now I'm sure that you've already heard about Ritual, but if you haven't, boy, are you in for a treat. Ritual makes multivitamins and supplements. They have multivitamins for both men and women of all ages, by the way, but I've been taking their Essential for Men 18 Plus Vitamin, and so that is what I'm gonna be talking about right now. Ritual's Essential for Men is a clinically backed, clean, high quality multivitamin for men ages 18 to 49 to help fill key nutrient gaps in the diet. Oh, and uh, that reminds me, I, I haven't, taken them yet today, so let me do that right now. I never thought that I would say this about a multi vitamin, but these actually taste good. They have this like slight minty taste and they're made with delayed release capsules. So they're gentle on your stomach. And another thing that's awesome too is unlike pretty much every other multivitamin that I've taken, you can take this multivitamin with or without food, which has honestly made it super easy for me to work them into my daily routine. I don't have to plan them around my meals and things like that. But even more importantly, Ritual's Essential for Men multivitamin is USP verified, which if you don't know what that is, I didn't before I started learning about Ritual. That is a third-party quality certification that sets one of the highest bars for product transparency. And just for reference, folks, less than 1% of multivitamins have earned this mark, which should show you just how special this multivitamin really is. But if you're still not convinced, which I don't know how you wouldn't be, but if you're not, I think this is going to do it for you. Ready? So if you're putting a vitamin or anything for that matter, into your body, you really wanna know exactly what's in it, of course. So Ritual's vitamins are made what we call traceable, and on their website, they show you exactly what's in each vitamin, and they even show you where in the world it came from, which in my opinion is just above and beyond when it comes to transparency. And the icing on the cake is that Ritual is going to hook my audience, AKA you, up with 25% off your first order. All you have to do is click the link in the description or use code KYLEHATESHIKING25 at checkout. So one more time, click that link or scan the QR code on the screen right now. Use that code and let's get back to the story. Chris and Lee San were planning to stay with a host family and to begin their volunteer work shortly after they arrived in Boquette. However, there must have been some sort of miscommunication because once the girls arrived, they were told that their volunteer jobs would not be starting for another week. This obviously meant that the girls now had some extra time on their hands. And what better way to fill that time than to explore the beautiful countryside around them. With this goal in mind, the girls decided to go for a hike. In the early afternoon of April 1st, 2014, Chris and Lee San took a taxi to the trailhead for a hike called El Pianista. By the way, uh, pronouncing words is not my strong suit, and that's even worse for words that are in, well, not English. And so I apologize if I butcher some of the names of the Spanish stuff in this video. So on this hike, they apparently brought with them a dog from the local village, and it's unclear to me exactly like who this dog belonged to, or even why the dog was with them for that matter. And so I'm sure there's people watching this video that know a lot about this story. And so if you know who the dog belonged to, then leave a comment. The only reason I mention it is because it is gonna play an important role in the beginning of this mystery. I did read one source that stated the dog belonged to the host family that the girls were staying with. And then another source said that the dog belonged to like the owner of a local restaurant. So I'm not really sure, but either way, they had a local dog with them on this hike. Chris was 21 years old and Lisanne was 22 years old. Now, both women were definitely fit, but I'm not sure that either one of them were experienced hikers. I've never been to the Netherlands, but my understanding is that it's very flat. At least that's what one of my friends from there told me. And it's certainly not comparable to the rugged terrain that the girls were setting off in on this hike. The trail that they were on, it's, it's not a long one per se. I, I guess it's only about two and a half miles or four kilometers each way but it is pretty steep and it's the jungle after all, so it's very wet. The trail gains roughly 2,000 feet or around 600 meters 
over the course of the climb, which is no joke, especially in such a short distance. However, despite the difficulty that I'm hyping this trail up with, the girls apparently made it to the top with pretty much no issue. They summited around 1 p.m. and they must have been really enjoying themselves. And the reason I say that is because for an unknown reason, they actually continued on past the summit instead of turning around and hiking back down to the trailhead. This is an incredibly significant detail. And to be honest, it's possibly the reason for this entire mystery in the first place. You see, this hike that they were on is designed as an out and back with the turnaround point being the summit that the girls reached. My understanding is that almost everybody who does this hike turns around at this point and I'm not even sure if there is like an official trail that runs beyond the summit. I've never hiked in Panama. I've never even been to Panama. I'd love to go by the way, if any of you watching are from Panama, but I'm willing to bet that there were probably some smaller herd paths, we call them, these unofficial unmaintained trails that, that branched off beyond the turnaround points. And I did read a few sources that speculated about this being the case as well. So it's possible that the girls followed one of these herd paths beyond the summit and it's not really clear to me why they did this, but for whatever reason they most likely did and this resulted in them never being seen alive ever again. So later in the day on April 1st, this dog that I told you about, the dog that they were hiking with, well, it returned back to its owner's property without the girls. They were nowhere to be found, and the following day, they had actually made an appointment with a local guide to go explore somewhere else, and well, they didn't show up for this appointment, and this made their host family very concerned. The girls were reported missing, and then on April 3rd, a local group of searchers set out to try and find them. And by the way, from everything that I've gathered, this initial search was pretty legit. It wasn't just like a few people hiking up and down the trail looking for them or whatever. I mean, this was a proper search. They had helicopters, they had dog teams, and of course they had like organized ground searchers as well. However, despite this effort, the girls could not be located. And it wasn't long before their parents were taking a impromptu and probably very nerve wracking plane ride to Panama. Joining them, by the way, were detectives from the girl's home country of the Netherlands. This meant that the search for Chris and Lisan, which was already very serious, well, it was now about to get ramped up to a whole new level. But even with the families now on the ground, on location, putting pressure on the searchers to find these missing women, no results were yielded. Day after day went by where the families of Chris and Lisan were told that their daughters had not been found and that they were still missing. These days quickly turned into weeks and eventually the local authorities in Panama began to halt their search efforts. A lot of time went by here, folks. I'm talking 10 whole weeks went by with no answers, but then just when everyone was starting to lose hope, as much as I hate to say it, a local woman made a bombshell discovery. She found a backpack. She found this backpack in a rice paddy near the banks of a river. This river was near the village of Alta Romero. Again, I probably said that wrong, I apologize. And it was some five miles away from where the girls had been hiking. This local woman finds the backpack and then once authorities inspected the contents of the backpack, it was immediately clear that it belonged to Chris and Lisan. The backpack contained roughly $80 in cash. It contained Lisan's passport, two bras, some sunglasses, a water bottle, two cell phones, and of course, a Canon digital camera. And one thing that's interesting to note is that despite being outside near the river for weeks, even potentially having floated down the river, the backpack and its contents were all dry, which was a little bit suspicious. But regardless of that, investigators now had this backpack and its contents, and they quickly turned their attention to the cell phones and of course the camera, hoping that these items would give some clues into the fates of the missing girls. 
So the the files and the data on these electronic devices is so important to this case. And so I'm actually gonna break them down separately. We're gonna start with the cell phones here. So Chris Kremers carried an iPhone 4 and Lisanne Froon carried a Samsung Galaxy S3. Activity from both of these cell phones shows that between 4.40 and 5 p.m. on April 1st, which is again, the day that the women disappeared, calls to the number 112 were made. Now, if you're American like me, you might not know the significance of this number, but my European, my Asian, and other international viewers will know that 112 is used to connect to the emergency line, aka it's the same thing as dialing 911. Oh, and by the way, speaking of dialing 911, the girls also tried to call this number as well. Multiple call attempts to 112 and 911 were made between the evening of April 1st and the morning of April 3rd. But unfortunately, due to the remoteness of the area that the girls were hiking in, none of these calls successfully connected and the girls were never able to actually speak with emergency dispatchers. And thus to this day, it's unknown exactly what the girls were calling about. So the bizarre activity on the cell phones doesn't end with these emergency calls, by the way. I found a fantastic article by a blogger named Chris. I couldn't find his last name. And this, this Chris character did a deep dive into the data from each of the girls' phones. It's called imperfectplan.com and I highly suggest you read it if you want even more details about the phone and the camera and honestly all of the details related to this case. I'll have a link to this blog in the description. You should go check it out. The girls started their hike with about 50% battery on each of their phones. Data shows that by the evening of April 1st, the girls were aware of their dwindling battery power and started to make efforts to conserve it, AKA they began powering on and off their phones as needed. It appears that Lisanne's Samsung phone ran out of battery on April 4th, but Chris's iPhone battery lasted longer. It appears that the Samsung phone was left on for longer periods of time, which is probably why it ran out of battery quicker. On April 5th, so I'm talking days after the girls had disappeared, the iPhone's SIM pin number was entered correctly on the phone for the last time. And I say for the last time, by the way, because there were numerous times over the next few days where the iPhone was powered on, but then the SIM number either wasn't entered correctly or it wasn't entered at all, which is very strange. And it's a, a big point of speculation in this case. Now there was no activity on either phone on April 7th, April 8th, or April 9th. But then on April 10th, there was an attempt to power on that Galaxy phone, but the battery was so low at this point that the attempt like registered in the phone's log, but it failed to actually power on the phone. And then the next day on April 11th, the iPhone was powered on for just over an hour. But once again, the SIM pin was either not entered or it was entered incorrectly. Like I just said there, the activity from Chris and Lisanne's phones has been a major factor in this case. It's led to tons of speculation about what happened to them. And a lot of people are asking if it was possible that somebody else besides the girls was attempting to use their phones, particularly after April 6th. Now, with that said, I told you that I would stick to the facts and so I won't speculate anymore right now, but you got to admit that definitely makes you wonder. Once again, go read the article I linked in the description for even more details about the cell phone data. There's like charts and all this stuff. It's, it's really cool. So now let's move on to the digital camera that was found in the girl's backpack. And to be honest with you, this camera is probably the reason I'm making this video right now because the images on it are so mysterious and frankly disturbing that I believe it's the main reason that this story went so viral in the first place. It makes sense, right? It's one thing to hear a story, but when you can actually see images from it, especially images that are just surrounded in mystery, well, it sticks out and it just makes you wonder. So inside the girl's backpack, 
Investigators found a Canon PowerShot camera and it apparently belonged to Lee San. The camera had over a hundred images on it, but my understanding is that only about half of the photos are available to the public right now. I don't even think that any of the photos were ever like officially released. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure they were actually leaked. So who knows what these other unknown unseen photos actually contain. The first series of photos that are relevant to this case were taken on April 1st, and they just show the girls enjoying their hike. This photo right here is one of the last photos taken during the day and was likely taken shortly before something went terribly wrong for the girls. It's one of those photos that looks pretty normal without any context but is actually pretty disturbing once you understand the circumstances of when it was taken. The photos get even more disturbing once nighttime rolls around. There were like 90 to 100 nighttime photos taken over a three hour period on April 8th. So a good week after the girls disappeared. My understanding is that none of these photos, except for this one right here, actually show the girls. This one in particular is presumed to show Chris Kremer's hair, possibly with like some blood in it. The context for this photo and the rest of the nighttime photos for that matter, it's not really known. And I'm not even gonna try to speculate what's going on here. If you are interested in that speculation, well, there's tons of Reddit threads, articles, and even videos that attempt to explain what you're looking at right now. The rest of the photos look pretty much like this. They show various natural features, the sky, and many of them were taken with the camera's flash illuminating the immediate area beyond the camera. This has led some people to suggest that the girls may have been using the flash to either, I don't know, signal for help or to even see what was in front of them. It's also been speculated that much like the cell phones, perhaps somebody else besides the girls took all of these nighttime photos. Again, I told you I wouldn't speculate that I would stick to the facts here, and so I'll leave that where it be, but there is a very puzzling fact about the series of photos that I haven't told you about yet. There was one photo, photo number 509, that was missing from the series of photos on the camera. So this Canon camera numbered each photo in consecutive order. And so photo number 508 was the last photo taken by the girls in the daylight. The next photo on the camera was photo number 510. And by the way, photo number 510 was the first of that disturbing sequence of nighttime photos taken a week after the girls disappeared. Photo number 509 did not exist. And even more perplexing was that there was literally zero sign of its data anywhere on the memory card. I am not a technical expert, but from what I understand, even if a photo was intentionally deleted from the camera, there would still be some sort of evidence of it on the memory card. Many experts have come out and said that it would be very unlikely for the camera to have like mistakenly skipped a number in the naming sequence, which leaves us to wonder if the camera may have been connected to a computer in order to erase that specific photo number 509. I have no idea who would have done this or why it would have been done. All we know is that something is weird about that missing photo. Something just doesn't really add up there. So after the backpack was discovered, Search efforts were renewed by investigators, and of course they zeroed in on the general location where the backpack was found. Some time passed, a few weeks I believe, but eventually these efforts would end up paying off big time when the partial remains of Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon were finally found. Investigators found Lisanne's left foot intact inside of her hiking boot. They continued searching the area and eventually recovered over 30 bones. And of course, DNA testing soon proved that the bones belonged to not just Lee San, but both girls. However, the strangeness of this story doesn't stop here. It's been reported that some of Lee San's remains 
still had like, this is kind of gross, but little bits of flesh attached. And yet Chris Kramer's bones were clean and looked as if they had been bleached. No one has been able to like definitively explain this inconsistency, though of course there's plenty of speculation about it. And by the way, no one has been able to determine what caused the girl's deaths either. I even found one source that stated there were bones from other individuals found with the bones of Kremers and Froon. And of course, if that's true, then it would definitely point towards foul play being the cause of their death. Though, I would take this with a grain of salt because most of the other sources I read didn't mention this, so it might be true, it might not be, I'm not really sure, and I don't want to BS you guys, so if you know more about this, please let me know in the comments. And uh, with all that said, those are pretty much the basic facts of this case as I understand them. And once again, this story has been covered countless times in other YouTube videos and podcasts and books and just about every single content medium out there. And so if you want a deeper dive into this case, you have plenty of options available. But now that I've laid everything out there, albeit at a very high level, of course, I just wanna dive in and go full speculation here, like I've been resisting so far in the video. What the hell happened to Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon? It seems to me that there are two main theories being talked about. Uh, the first of which is foul play, and then the second theory being that the girls died naturally, due to an accident in the backcountry. I'm gonna break these theories down a little bit one by one, and of course, I'll let you decide which one makes the most sense. I feel like in a lot of missing hiker cases, foul play is assumed when the evidence doesn't always support it. In this case, however, foul play is absolutely plausible. Uh, there's just a lot of things that don't really make sense with the camera, with the bones that were found, and also with the cell phone activity. In my opinion, the most damning pieces of evidence that point to foul play are the photo number 509 that appears to have been purposely deleted, and then the girl's bones being found in different stages of decay. However, there's even more evidence of foul play that I haven't really touched on yet, though my understanding is that much of this is speculation and rumor. It's not proven fact necessarily. And that's the reason why I didn't include it when I was telling you the facts of the story. But I will mention now that some people have suggested that the girl's backpack may have been planted sometime after they disappeared. And I will admit that it's a little strange that it took 10 weeks for the backpack to be found. And I say that because, well, during that 10 weeks, there was intense searching going on for the girls. Of course, the backpack was found in a different location than the actual hiking trail they disappeared from, but it's still relatively close, like five miles away. So I don't know, I just, I feel like it probably would have been found. I also mentioned earlier that despite the backpack being found next to a river, well, it was dry and so were its contents. That's how I understand it and I don't know. The camera and the phones, they were still working, which I find a little bit strange because if they had been floating downstream for some time, again, I'm not an expert on this, but you'd think that the electronics would have been like fried or broken. And another strange piece of information that I have not yet mentioned is that the last person known to have seen the girls alive, which was the taxi driver that dropped him off at the trailhead on April 1st, well, he ended up dying under suspicious circumstances less than a year after the girls went missing. And I will say, I guess it's worth mentioning this, but it's probably just a coincidence. I don't know. And I'm certainly not suggesting that this guy was involved with the girls' disappearances at all, but this 34 year old gentleman, Leonardo Gonzalez, well, he died in an apparent drowning in March of 2015 while he was waiting to shuttle a group of tourists back from a river. Again, you can make of that what you will. It's been scrutinized a ton online, and so who knows if that's related or not, you know, I don't know. But of course, all of the things I just told you about, all this stuff may suggest foul play resulted in the girls' deaths, but it doesn't suggest who was responsible. And I think that's a big deal because it's hard to say that the girls were like definitively murdered when there isn't a clear party that is responsible for it. And besides, I mean, accidents in the backcountry happen. People get lost, especially when they're in unfamiliar terrain as these girls were. 
and people die as a result of this. And so with that said, if you go on any online forums discussing this case, you're gonna realize pretty quickly that there are a lot of people who dismiss foul play in this story. And a lot of people that believe the girls died an accidental death. And despite some of the suspicious evidence and circumstances in this story, I do think that there's merit to the accidental death argument. After all, they were hiking in some pretty gnarly terrain. I mean, the jungle is not a place to mess around. And so perhaps they made a bad choice to continue further down the unofficial trail past the summit where most people turn around. And then they got lost and eventually fell or just died from exposure. Maybe somebody found the backpack a short time later, took it home, not really realizing its significance. And then they saw the news about the case and they were like, oh, I don't wanna be associated with this backpack. And so they just left it on the river, hoping that somebody else would find it. Maybe the camera did actually malfunction, thus skipping photo number 509. And maybe the girls took those mysterious night photos in order to illuminate the forest for navigation purposes or to signal rescuers. Or maybe none of that happened. Maybe there is some other theory that I didn't even touch on in this video that I'm not even aware of. I mean, the truth about the disappearances and the deaths of Chris Kremers and Lee San Froon is that we, we just don't know what happened. There are people out there that swear they have this case figured out, and I'm not even suggesting that they're wrong, but all I'm saying is that we, the general public, we just don't know. That is the cold hard truth, despite all the speculation, despite all the theories and deep dives, and despite all the podcasts and YouTube videos. I wish I had a more interesting conclusion to share with all of you, but I'm never gonna be that guy that lies, misleads, or exaggerates in order to get views and make a more interesting video. The truth is, we just don't know. Let me know what you think happened in the comments, and if you have any content suggestions for those that want even more details about this case, well, feel free to leave those in the comments as well. YouTube seems to think you'll enjoy watching this video next, so give it a click, and I'll see all of you next week. Thank you so much for watching and continuing to support this channel. You guys are the best subscribers on YouTube, hands down. Just thank you.